wandering into our midst and being here. And if you are joining us on Zoom and YouTube Live this morning, extend a special welcome to you, part of this congregation virtually. And if you are tuning in for the first time uh, on YouTube, uh, or not the first time, and you want to learn more about our church, I encourage you after worship to go to trinitypreschurch.org, where you can learn more about uh, our congregation, our family of faith, and who we are seeking to be as we grow together and welcome all. Every day, I, I usually say this, every day is a special day in the life of the church, and I usually say that when there is something to share with you that might make it just a little extra special, uh, and that is the case today. We are so excited uh, to have with us finally our Associate Pastor for Engagement and, and Mission, Reverend Rebecca Heilman. Uh, and I think Rebecca wants to say a few words as, as well, if you will, to come over there. But we're, she's here. Yay. So, Rebecca. I have been looking forward to this day for quite a bit right now, and I'm so glad that I get to worship with all of you, either here or afar on Zoom or YouTube, at the end of this service. And from so with social distance and masks, I hope that we can greet to each other and find some joy. Thank you for letting me be here and worship with all of you. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, the only announcement I have is to let you know that the session has called a congregational meeting uh, for Sunday, September the 13th. So that's two Sundays from today. Uh, this is uh, for the purpose of acting on a recommendation from the officer nominating committee uh, regarding the next class of elders and the next class of the nominating committee members. So we'll do that after worship. Uh, we will have, as we uh, did with our congregational meeting back in July, options for people on Zoom, for our church members on Zoom to participate in that meeting. Uh, so just stay tuned for that. My friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as we gather together this morning and worship our God.
I invite you now to stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. In a time of bitterness and pain, God raised up Moses and changed the lives of a people. From the shadow of death, God raised up Jesus and changed the lives of all people. And every time, and in every place, God raises up witnesses, people whose lives are changed forever. We are raised up this morning as we worship our God. May our lives forever be changed. day. Let us also be transparent with each other about our lives and about our living. Let us offer to God the truth as we pray together. God of mercy, we confess our struggle to be transformed into disciples of yours. The desires of the world would shape us into people you would not recognize. The demands of our society pull us away from your heart. Our culture values the rich, the powerful, the successful, but you are on the side of the weak, the poor, the outcast, the oppressed. Forgive us, God of mercy, for looking for you in the wrong places. Reawaken us with your voice that calls us to service. Revive our weary hearts with your vision of creation. Refresh our fatigued spirits that we might boldly proclaim Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior and go forth to serve your people in Christ's name. May we take this time to reflect silently about our lives and about our living.
please stand as you are able and join me in the assurance of pardon. It's too easy to think like the world, but Paul reminds us that if we think like Christ, we will find true freedom. Our hearts and spirits will be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Christ is the essence of peace. And in these uncertain times, his peace is what brings us comfort. So I invite you now to pause, take a deep breath in, exhale, feeling Christ's peace pulse through you, and then take a moment to pass that peace at a safe distance through words and gestures, texts and emails to the people nearest you. The peace of Christ be with you. today comes from Paul's letters to the Romans. It's believed this letter was sent by Phoebe with the understanding that Paul will be visiting them at some point in the future as he makes his way to Spain. In this section of the letter, he is concerned about the aspects of Christian life particularly giving imperatives or commands that focus on relationships and how we are to be in relationship with one another. So listen to Paul's words now from Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to the strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for that is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with the good. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that you place on each of our hearts not only be acceptable in your sight, but stir us to greater discipleship in your name. We pray this. Amen. Endings 
can often make the best of beginnings. Growing up at White Memorial Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, I heard my pastor give the same benediction every Sunday. That pastor, whose name was Dr. Pickard, was at White Memorial for 29 years. He was the pastor who baptized me. He was a pastor who was there throughout my college years until his retirement. And my family was one of those families that, barring us being out of town or severe illness, and I mean like loss of limb severe illness, we were in church come Sunday morning. We were that family. So you add up all those services of all those years, you throw in a couple of extra ones like Christmas Eve and the like, and then you throw in some services that I attended when I was home in college. And I have calculated that I heard my pastor give this benediction around 800 times. Go out into the world in peace, have courage. Hold on to that which is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. It became so familiar to me, this benediction, that for years I would mouth the words along with him as he spoke it down to its very rhythm and cadence, so that it was not just his benediction, it was mine too. It was a last word spoken at every service, but the funny thing is, the more I experienced it, the more I began to understand that it was actually leading me forward. It was leading me into the week that was going to come, going with me into whatever that week would bring, reminding me of who I was, and whose I was, and that is why endings can make for the best of beginnings. For years, I just assumed that these words, this benediction, were Dr. Pickard's own words. I had no reason to think otherwise. I thought that highly of the man. To me, his voice from the pulpit was scripture come to life. It wasn't until I was in seminary studying to be a pastor myself that I learned that these words were actually based on Paul's letter to the churches in Rome, specifically the passage Rebecca just read for us. It is not verbatim, but you certainly hear the echoes. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Rejoice in hope. Now, there are 16 chapters in the book of Romans. Today's passage comes from the 12th. It follows 11 chapters of some of Paul's greatest theological writings. It is masterful the way that Paul lays out the case for justification by faith through grace. It is a bedrock of our Reformed tradition all these years later. It is not the most exciting of reading. There's not a lot of story or narrative in it. That's a struggle for me. I like those stories and narratives, but really, honestly, so much of what we believe as Christians comes from those 11 chapters. Now, Paul is writing these 11 chapters for a very specific reason. Rebecca alluded to it. Unlike most of the other churches that Paul was writing to, churches in Galatia and Corinth and Philippi, Paul had never been to the churches in Rome. And it's not one church. It was multiple churches. Paul had never been there. So Romans is more or less a kind of cold call. He doesn't have a relationship with the churches in Rome, but he would very much like to have a relationship with the churches in Rome. And he hopes that in telling them a little bit about himself and telling them a little bit about what he thinks about the faith that they might see fit to support him in his mission work, which is part of the reason why Paul lays out this grand theological masterpiece in the first 11 chapters. It is kind of like a pastor sharing their best sermon video with the search committee. I thought that would be an appropriate analogy for the time that we're in in this congregation. You don't, you don't give the, like, the worst sermon, right? You put the best one. Exactly. Not that you have a worse one. I'm, I'm, you, they're all good. They're all good. 
But there is something else that's going on in this letter that maybe is not as obvious. And it has to do with the fact that these churches are churches in Rome. And Rome, as we all know, was the heart, the very center of the Roman Empire, an empire that was more or less started a half a century before and was in control of most of the known world at that time. We know that life in the Roman Empire was a tenuous balance of order and chaos where those in power, namely the emperor, ruled with absolute power. What that meant was that the language of empire was violence. The governing principle of empire was domination and fear. The culture of empire, as one scholar puts it, did not permit any suggestion that the current order may not last forever or that it was arranged with anything other than the best of intentions by the holders of power. And any breaches of this culture were met with the range of sanctions up to and including the threat or practice of violence. All of this kind of combined into what was known and what we know today as Pax Romana. It's Latin, it means Roman peace, which of course was not a real peace, but a culture of maintaining order in a way that ensured the security and safety of those in power while threatening the well being and safety of those outside of that power. You know, I try to imagine being the early church right in the heart of all of that. The challenges that would inevitably arise from that, the relentless temptation, I would think, to align oneself, that church, with the Roman domination system for self-preservation and power. I try to think about what it was like walking those Roman streets lined with crosses and men hanging from those crosses, men who had threatened that precious Pax Romana, including one man upon which an entire faith would be built. Paul's letter to the Roman churches was more than an ask for support. It was a survival guide. It was written to the people of God living right in the belly of the empire, reminding them that what they believed about God and why that mattered and how they needed to live in the midst of all of that. And so once again, this time from the message translation, Paul implores them in our passage today to run from evil and hold on to good. Do not quit in hard times. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies and do not curse them under your breath. Laugh with your friends when they're happy. Shed tears when they're down. Discover beauty in everyone. And my favorite line of the whole passage, love from the center of who you are. This is how the church survives and even thrives in empire. Even though it was a dangerous and risky life that Paul was calling these Roman Christians to because it meant standing in defiance of Pax Romana and calling it out for the lie that it was. You know, I read these words from Paul written thousands of years ago, words that in variation I have been living with all my life because of my wonderful pastor growing up. I sense in these words, power for the people of faith. I hear these words and I think of the context that they were birthed into in these Roman churches. And I wonder, I wonder what these words might be saying to us today. So a wise pastor friend once told me that our job as preachers is not to tell people what to think but what to think about. Now, I find that understanding of preaching extremely helpful. That my job, that Rebecca's job, is not to tell people what to think, 
but what to think about. So, I would like to lay before you a, for a few things this morning that I want to ask us to think about. I want us to think about the pandemic we are living in that has impacted nearly every aspect of our lives in profound ways, from disruptions of routines and schools to the loss of jobs to the hundreds of thousands around the world who have died. We are approaching 1 million people around the world who have died from this thing. And we know that this is not a short-term ordeal. We are hunkering in for the long haul. I want us to think about that. I want us to think about the current state of things around us. A contentious fall election on the horizon. Climate change that makes powerful storms even more destructive. Conflicts that are deep and painful with more yelling than listening, more posturing than bridge building. Think about that. I want us to think about the racial divide and division in our country. It is a divide that has been with us for 400 years, but throughout our nation's history, it has had moments where that fissure cracks wide open in profound and frankly frightening ways and how we are in one of those moments right now. Think about what it means, y'all, that a black man in Wisconsin can be shot seven times by per police for purportedly possessing a knife that may have been somewhere in his car. And as of this morning right now, is paralyzed from the waist down and handcuffed to his hospital bed for charges he has not yet been informed of. And how three nights after that shooting, a 17 year old kid who was white with an AR-15 strapped across his chest, can roam the streets in full view and support of authorities and later shoot and kill two people and still drive home to sleep in his own bed that night. Think about that. And think about how we see that same inequity and injustice of that racial divide play itself out for us over and over and over and over again. I want us to think about what we in the church are supposed to do with all of this. Because it is becoming more clear, if it wasn't already, that what ails our country at this moment, what is ripping us apart, cannot be summed up as just a societal problem or just an economic problem or just an environmental problem or just a political divide problem. No, at its heart, what we are facing in this moment is a spiritual problem. And I'm not talking about the kind of spiritual problem that can be solved if you just believe in Jesus, everything will be okay. No, this is a deep sickness of the soul. It is the same sickness that Paul had in his mind when he wrote to the churches living in empire, exposing the lie of Pax Romana that we now hear echoed in calls for law and order. It is a spiritual sickness, my friends, in that it seeks to undo what it means to be created in the image of God, or more to the point, it seeks to redefine who is created in that image and who is not. Who is worthy of human value and recognition and who is not. It is the white supremacy culture that we are all living in and that at its core, my friends, that culture is a spiritual sickness, a spiritual pandemic. 
And if our communities and our cities and our country and our planet are going to be healed, truly healed of this sickness, the people of God and the church have got to step it up. And so I want us to think about what it means in this moment, in this moment, what it means to go out into the world in peace. What it means in this moment to hold on to that which is good and return no one evil for evil. What it means in this moment to strengthen the faint hearted and support the weak. What it means in this moment to help the suffering and honor all people. Whatever that means for you, for the love of God, do it. For you, church, you are the doctors and nurses of this spiritual pandemic. You are the doctors and nurses of this spiritual pandemic. You are the frontline workers providing the essential services of advocacy for marginalized voices and leveraging your power for change. You are the store owner confronting defiant patrons and compelling them to do not just what benefits them, but what is in the common good of all. You are the educators instructing us to call out instances of racism when we see them and the promulgation of lies and distortions of facts when we hear them. You are the poll workers keeping in check our institutions and making sure that things are done the right and just way. You, church, are called in this spiritual pandemic to be front and center in God's healing work. You are the ones you've been waiting for. So let us love from the center of who we are. Let's get to building God's kingdom on earth. Right here and right now. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, thanks be to God. And may all of God's people say, amen.
Siblings in Christ, I invite you to remain standing as we share our affirmation of faith using words from a first catechism approved by our General Assembly in 1998. For many of you who remember catechisms as being the staple of Sunday school ministry, this might ring true. I invite you to join me, of course, reading the all parts. Who are you? I am a child of God. What does it mean to be a child of God? that I belong to God who loves me. What makes you a child of God? Grace, God's free gift of love that I do not deserve and cannot earn. How do you thank God for this gift of love? I promise to love and trust God with all my heart. How do you love God? By worshiping God, by loving others, and by respecting what God has created. What does it mean that we are made in God's image? It means we are made to reflect God's goodness, wisdom, and love. Be seated. Let us gather our hearts in prayer. God of love, whether gathered here in our outdoor sanctuary at a safe distance from each other, or at a kitchen table or a desk facing a device, you call us to genuine love. Love that does not pretend. Love that comes from the very center of you. And it's with this love that we turn towards our world, witnessing the depths of its pain. A world that is literally in flames, while simultaneously struck down with high winds and water, leaving thousands homeless and distressed. We pray for safety and shelter for all those affected. A world that carries a cacophony of angry voices, bitterness, hate, disgust towards lives that matter, while simultaneously voices seeking liberation, freedom, and life. A world where many are isolated, lonely, and whose bodies are broken down by a virus and pandemic, while simultaneously a world where many do not care about the health and the body of the other. The only way we know how to turn towards a world of pandemonium that shakes us to our core is with genuine love. For we know this is how you respond as well, O oh God. So we love our neighbors and we love those experiencing the drudge of homelessness with the care we can give them right now. We love our family, and we also show our love to the people who pick up our garbage, as well as our nurses, doctors, teachers, and grocery store providers. We love our friends. And we also love the family and friends of Jacob Blake as they pray every day for his life and what it means for his name to be splashed upon the media like so many before him. We love our pets and we also, we also love the bully, even when it's the most difficult love to carry. In this kingdom where the hopeless are thrown into a lake forgotten, may you hear our prayers and the love we carry for one another, oh God, because when you do, you somehow, in some mysterious way, you take them into your immense heart and shower light and love into people who are hurting and people who are rejoicing and people who are wandering. May your light shine particularly bright during this wild and even scary season where many are mourning, whether they are mourning their beloved or mourning the loss of freedom. Whatever it is that we grieve, O oh God, hear our prayers and hold them close. For there are those who are in pain discomfort, distress, homebound, homeless, held back, or merely struggling to get out of bed. 
we pray they find hope, strength, and most important, the recognition that they are loved, they are seen, and every inch of them matters. It's with this, O oh God, that we settle this prayer and all those unspoken into our hearts and pray aloud the prayer your beloved son taught, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors each other, serves our neighbors with joy, and shares our love and material possessions. Let us give thanks, rejoicing in what we have been given, and give our tithes and offerings to God, either online, where there are multiple options under the tab, Give, or through a check in a mail, or at the basket in the back of the worship space. There are many ways for you to give. Thanks be to God for all of God's gifts, and thanks be to God for all of you. pray with me. God, we dedicate these gifts freely given and gratefully received to the work of this congregation and your kingdom as we build honest, caring relationships across all lines of difference, as we grow in spirit and search for meaning, as we promote radical hospitality, practice compassion, and work for justice. May these gifts and the work of our hands and hearts give power to all we stand for as a community of faith. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before Michael plays, repeat after me. We will go out with joy in the spirit. We will go out with God. Try that too. Ready? And. We will go out with joy in the spirit. We will go out with God. Do that again. And. We will go out with joy in the spirit. We will go out with God. Now the refrain goes this way, listen. Alleluia. Sing that. Alleluia. Now listen to this. We will go out with joy. Sing it, go. We will go out with joy. Now listen. Alleluia. Try that one. Alleluia. Listen to this. 
Alleluia. Sing that. Alleluia. Now we'll let Michael play and you should know this hymn. <laughs> song to end on uh prior to the benediction i want to remind you uh that at the request of our support team we are going to sort of officially welcome uh rebecca to our congregation uh lining the sidewalk here uh socially distance and step back about maybe three feet from the sidewalk and then so she can go and you can say hi to her and maybe warren uh or some other members of the support team might be able to just help organize people uh as we as we do that the benediction for today is the benediction that I grew up with from Dr. Pickard, and I am going to invite you to say it with me together so that we all say these words and have these words embedded in our heart. So join me in our benediction today. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to that which is good, return no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forever. Amen and amen.
that, that the only thing about that is, is that he built the academy in there during the day, so he really impacted a lot of classrooms through off the 